cardigans look great. But um, here we are. I have the privilege of bringing the word today, and I never take advantage of the opportunity. And it's, it's an amazing opportunity. And um, man, just the, the weight behind preparing for all of this, it's, it's heavy, y'all. Especially when we're talking about the values that this church is built upon. See, if you have been here over the past weeks, or if this is your first time here, we've been going through this series called The Church I See, and uh, we've been going over our values here. We've got 10 values and one mission, and I'm hoping now at this point in time, the mission has it's sunk into your soul. Like you understand what our mission is, and, and God is starting to unlock what you are, the puzzle piece to that mission, right? So we're going to say this together. Our mission here at Journey Church, you could read it on the, the screen, or if you know it already, let's do this together. Our mission is to see our cities transform by the power of the gospel for the glory of God in our generation. Isn't that good, y'all? And the ironic part about that is, for all of you, who are first-time guests in here? If you're first-time guests in here, okay, cool. Not everyone is in here. Or maybe there's, there's people watching online, but maybe people are visiting from out of town. But wherever you go, we want to see that city transform. We don't want to just see Jacksonville transform or Clay County or Duval. We want to see cities, right? That's where you become the puzzle piece, wherever you're planted in your community, in your neighborhood, in your job. That's where we want to see things transform. And we really felt like God was saying, hey, it, it, the vision behind this, how are we going to accomplish this is, is we want to build a community of people here that does life around the presence of God. We've been talking about that a lot and, and the importance of being in the presence of God. And, and why do we want to be in the presence of God always? Because we're stubborn, selfish people and nothing good comes from us and apart from him, Right? Like if we're going to build this church, if we're going to do kingdom things for him, if we're going to do things that last, we got to be in his presence, y'all. Like, how do you know what he wants to do if you're not in his presence? How do you know what his voice sounds like if you don't know what his voice sounds like, if you're not close to him? So we're saying, God, we want to be a community of people that does life around your presence, God. And that's our heart here. So from week to week, we've really been unpacking these values and how we operate in each and every one of them and how it supports our mission statement. So last week, uh, Pastor Adam brought our value of edification. Who was here for that one? Man, I hope and pray that you've been practicing edification in the life, your life, your family's life, and in others. So we say it like this, we speak life, just like Jackie was saying, we speak life into somebody. We don't tear them down. We say we call something out of them like, and help them walk in their purpose. That's how we use our language. That's how we use our verbiage, right? That's edification. But this week, I have the privilege of bringing to you our value of excellence. Ooh. That's why it's weighty. And I'm like, God, you want me to speak on excellence? I got so many things going on, but you want me to speak on excellence? Yes. Why is excellence so important? I'll tell you why. Because it is the attitude at how we approach the mission, how we accomplish things in life. Right? We're not saying we're perfect people, but how do we accomplish the mission? The heart and the attitude behind it is we want to do it with excellence. So your determination, your focus, all of that is the attitude in which we do it. And this is how we are defining excellence here at Journey. And we say it like this. You can read it on the board. We represent the Lord by doing the best we can with what we have. Everything, say everything, everything, has room for improvement. Come on. And we will have an attitude of whatever it takes, whatever it takes to make it better than yesterday. So simply put, make it better. Say make it better. Make it better. That goes not just for this church, but for your life. Do better. Become better. Do better than yesterday. You woke up. So notice that we didn't say God gave us a value of saying, hey, God, we want to represent you by being perfect. Come on, there are perfect people in this room? All right, you say that. But see, that's our attitude, right? We're not perfect. Our, our, our attitude is, God, we're willing to bring our best. We're willing to grow. We're willing to develop. We identify the things that need to be better, and we work on them, right? Right? So by now, most of you know that I'm a practical guy, and, and what I say from the pulpit, I want to make sure that you can easily apply them to your life, 
right? I don't want to get all eloquent because I'm not an eloquent guy. I'm just simple meats and potatoes. I like food. So I'm just going to give it to you like that, right? So practically speaking, this is what I think excellence looks like. It looks like using your time, using your resources, your platforms, your businesses, your money, your bodies, your relationships, using your dreams. Come on, y'all. Who's got dreams in here? Yeah, awaken those. They're not just for you. God wants you to use those things well, excellently. Why? Because guess what? It points others to him and it brings him glory. See, we want to be an excellent first and lasting impression of God's church, do we not? Not just a first impression, a lasting one. One that is eternal. One that goes beyond just today. Because like I said, excellent honors God's It inspires people. So do you want to live a God-honoring life? Then live a life of excellence. Do you want to live a life that inspires the world around you to follow Jesus? Well, then live a life of excellence. And see, it's not so much that I feel like God desires that of us. But if we could really be honest, he deserves our highest everything. Right? Right? And so, Father, in this moment, would you speak, Holy Spirit, to your people? Open their minds and open their hearts to receive a timely word from you, God. Would you reveal things in our lives that we need to make better, Father? But, Lord, may this attitude of excellence be something that we carry with us, not just today, but for the rest of our lives, Lord. So we're committing to you a life that is willing to say, yes, God. So God, would you use this word as it goes before us today? And would you be my mouthpiece in Jesus' name? Amen, amen, amen. And so I'm really excited. If you can't tell, I'm I'm super high energy. I didn't take any pre-workout, but I did um, have a couple cups of coffee. So I guess that's equal. And so we're going to be kicking it off on a ton of different verses today, okay? I'm going to be going quick, all right? Our first thing we're going to go into is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, you can open to that one. I think we'll hang out on that one a little bit more than the other ones. But if not, you can follow the, uh, the words on slides on the screen. But I want to give you some context about 1 Thessalonians 4. See, the Apostle Paul is writing to a church, a new a church, a church of young believers, and he's reiterating to them the standards of living. And see, y'all, the Bible is so, so real. It's not just a textbook of history. Like, it's not just applicable for them. It's applicable for us. So I want to reiterate a standard of living for us. Is that good? Okay. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Finally then, brothers and sisters, we request and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive instructions from us as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel even more. That you live an excellent life, that you excel in that even more. Skip down to verse 3. He said, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles do, who do not know God. So right off the back, the apostle Paul is saying, hey, Christians, if you bear the name of Christ, young teenagers, if you bear the name of Christ, uh, adults, if you bear the name of Christ, you ought to be walking, thinking, talking, everything differently than the world. There's no questions asked. And furthermore, you should walk in a way that pleases God. You should excel in doing that. Skip down to the latter half of verse 10. Here's another thing he says you should excel in. He says, but we urge you, brothers and sisters, to excel even more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, uh uh-oh, and to attend to your own business, uh uh-oh, and work with your hands just as we instructed you. Hold up. Paul, what are you saying? Uh, You're saying that I don't have to, like, tell everybody what I'm doing on social media or, 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 or always be talking? You should probably lead a quiet life. You mean I don't have to be in their business? I can tend to my business and we can still get along well enough called unity and and he can handle his and I can handle mine. Yeah, excel in that. 
Also, you should do well. You should work hard with your hands in everything you do, not just for a paycheck. Who here serves here at Journey Church? You should work hard in doing that. Amen? Wherever you are planted, you should work hard in doing that. 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 through 13 says, For when we were with you, you gave this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. <laughs> we hear that some of you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. Oh, shoot. Such people we command and urge in Lord Jesus Christ to settle down. Settle down, y'all, and earn the food that they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. So Paul's saying, hey, y'all, don't be lazy. Don't get tired of doing what's good. Hey, furthermore, if you're being a busybody or you're idly doing nothing, you should be using that time to be continuously doing good. Excel in that. Like, if you don't work, you don't eat. If you don't work on your spiritual life, you don't grow. Don't expect maximum results for minimum effort. It's like, why we want to be here, but we don't want to put the effort in. So Jesus says in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So in other words, when you do good, when you excel in doing good, when you create beautiful things because God has laid it on your heart, when you are great at what you do, it, 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 it inspires others. It brings honor and glory to him. Colossians 3, 23 through 24 says, in whatever you do, Whatever you do, work at it with all, say all, all, your heart. As for working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Can I just say, like, if you're tired in here, if you are continuously doing that, keep going. You're not serving us here, you're serving God. Is the burden heavy? Absolutely. Are your responsibilities thick and the list is mile long? Absolutely. But guess what? At the end of the day, you are serving the Lord Jesus Christ, not us, not your boss. We fix our eyes on eternal reward, not just hear what's happening today, right? That's why we're saying, God, we want to re represent you by doing the best we can with what we have. Say, we admitted that we're imperfect people, so we always have room for improvement. But guess what? Being aware of our improvements is not enough. That's why we said we will never get tired of doing what is good. We will always do whatever it takes to make it better than yesterday. We will strive and work to do things continually well. And listen, y'all, this is not just a, this is how we build this church message. You can apply this into your life. Like, this is not just how you apply it here in church, but apply this to your marriage. Apply this to your parenting skills. Apply this to your, uh, your, your job and your resources, your businesses. See, like, what if we actually approached our marriage as unto the Lord? How much better would that be? How much better would our parenting be if we approached it as unto the Lord? How much better would our area of service or our relationships or our businesses or our jobs be if we just submitted it unto the Lord? So I got to thinking of what it might look like to live an excellent life and, and how we might just get really practical with this value. And I came up with four statements as to how we could live this life of excellence, you know, lives that bring honor and glory to God and, and ultimately inspire people to follow him. And my first statement is, we will always bring our best. It's so simple, right? See, it's not that we are the best, but we bring our best. And I love the Bible. There's amazing verses just like this. Proverbs 12, 11 says, Lazy people irritate their employers <laughs> like vinegar to the teeth or smoke in the eyes. That's in the Bible, y'all. You should read that. Read it more often and you'll get a good chuckle at three in the morning or whenever you do your quiet time. Hey, if it makes it sink in a little bit differently, read it like this. Lazy people irritate people. They irritate people like vinegar to the teeth, 
and smoke in the eyes. Like, hey, what's the opposite of inspiring others to follow God? It's got to be that you're irritating so bad that they don't want to be around you. They don't want to know your God. What about... What about the opposite of lazy? It's got to be someone that brings their very best in every situation, in every moment. Like I've had a lot of jobs that I haven't liked. I completely hated that. Who can relate to that? Oh, man, you love your jobs? Okay. See, I love this one. This is not a job, though. It's a calling. It's, it's, a, it's a calling, okay? And so there's a difference. Some of you have careers and callings, and some of you are living out your calling through your career, and that's great. Some of you have a career and a calling and you're trying to figure out how to live that calling through. I would encourage you, you can actually do that. But like I said, not all of them I've ever liked. Some of them I've been in places where the work culture was just absolutely terrible. The leadership was terrible. You know, I, I, I've been asked to do things that like I didn't quite agree with and, and um, that's just the life of the military. But you find yourself in these situations, you're like, I'm just gonna continue doing my best, right? And what I found in a lot of these situations, I remember faces and scenarios where it would give me an opportunity to share my faith. I was always a different guy. Maybe you're that different guy or different woman, different person in your school. You stick out because you don't necessarily do the things, you walk differently than the world. It may not be the situation and scenario you want to be in at the time. It may not be somewhere where you feel necessarily called to, and that's okay. But I would say bring your best in that situation. I remember situations where they would ask me what I'm doing on the weekend, and I'd tell them I'm going to church, and it, one thing would lead to another. And over a, a, a wide span of time, I would be able to pray with these people. And even to this day, I have people from many jobs prior that still call me like, hey, I just want to check in. Hey, you'd be proud. I got saved. <laughs> you know, I, I got that from this guy that I, I worked with six years ago. I'm like, oh my goodness. And then I would share things like, yeah, I think they would ask me, what do you want to do in your next life? I'm like, well, it's not this. I want to be working with people in some ministry in some aspect. I don't know what it looks like. I, I want to own a business and be able to do good things for people. And, and I'm like, these are my dreams. And so I'm laying this path for Christ to just be glorified and inspire others to do these things. And, and lo and behold, they still contact me and God gives us great opportunities to do these things. See, where it got me thinking, you know, sometimes we separate ministry and calling like they're two separate co- uh, categories. When in fact, what if we woke up every day and decided it was the same? What if we woke up every day and said that, Everywhere we go, every space we walk into, whether it's our job, everywhere that we get paid for, every, every school class that we go to or school event or every group that we go to or the store is a ministry moment. See, we are ministers. We are ambassadors of Jesus. We are his kingdom people here on earth. Right? Like I think of Daniel in the Bible. Daniel was a prisoner of war and he was enslaved in exile. And, and I guarantee you, he did not enjoy his workplace environment. Like he was a slave. He was in exile. He did not agree with his workplace culture. He had problems with the people in charge. But Daniel 6, 3 says this, that Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole entire kingdom. That's good, y'all. So Daniel, who doesn't like where he's at, Daniel, who doesn't agree much with what's going on or the culture, he doesn't like his workplace environment, he just shows up every day with exceptional quality and does the very best that he can. And this is the amazing part. He catches the eye of an earthly king and at the same time is bringing honor and glory to a heavenly king and he's inspiring others to follow him. And guess what happens? He gets promoted and promoted and he gets better and better and better. Isn't that good? That's easy stuff, but we don't want to do the hard work. Oh, you have to bring me down. Check this out. Proverbs 18.9 says, a lazy person is bad as someone who destroys things. Ooh. I'm not just talking about work. But if we're lazy in our spiritual life, look at the times that we're in. If you're lazy in your spiritual life, it, the Proverbs says it's as bad as someone who destroys things. See, when you look at a person who always brings their best, 
When you look at a person who's, who's trying to progress, who's continuously taking that mistake and making it better, when you look at this person who's moving forward and getting promoted or, or, or here's God gives you this opportunity, a small opportunity, and you're able to grow that. When you look at that person, that is the person that God wants to use for his glory. So work hard. In everything you do, we are bringing our best. You'll hear this verse throughout this message. Colossians 3.24 it says, whatever you do, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. It is Lord Jesus Christ you are serving. Secondly, the second statement is, we're always getting better. Say, we're always getting better. Say, we're always getting better. So on Tuesdays, the staff gets together here and, and we pray. We intercede on behalf of the church. We intercede on behalf of what God's uh, putting on our hearts and different ministries and, and, and things that come up within prayer requests and stuff like that. We pray for you guys. And then when we break away from our, our, our prayer session, we go and we do what we call, we, we talk about our wins. We celebrate the wins. We testify God's goodness. And then we talk about how we can make things better. Come on. And everybody has these lists in their life, right? Like this week alone, we got to celebrate the fact that last, last week, people got saved and rededicated their life, come on. And we want that more often. And then we got to celebrate this week the fact that the youth are catching fire and Pastor Corey McKenzie are doing a phenomenal job, right? The next generation is growing. And this is the season, this is the time. We got to celebrate these things, y'all. And then we get to the make it better section and it looks like a mile long. And that's okay because we're really hard on ourselves. We're really hard on ourselves. Why? Because I promise you if you've noticed something that's messed up on the screen or something out of place here or maybe in your own life, you've, these little fine minutia details, I promise you we've seen it and we're agonizing over it and we're saying, God, we want to just make this better. Why? Maybe I'm the one who dropped the ball. I better be the first one to say, I, I messed up. I, I got to make it better. Why? Because what we do here is more important than anything, y'all. Like, some of y'all might be thinking, don't you think you're emphasizing excellence a little too much, especially in church? It seems like you guys are nitpicking little things. It's just a church. I mean, Jesus, isn't, isn't he worthy of our highest praise? Isn't he worthy of everything of our best? See, what we do here is more important than what Amazon does, y'all. It's more important than what Apple does. They just deliver technology or packages and we spend all our money. It's more important than that. And they do things exceptionally well. We've been given the only mission in life that matters. We want to see people come to a saving knowledge of him and a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the only mission that matters in life. See, Amazon and Apple, they, they're, they're great at doing what they're doing, but... Here, we're ambassadors of Christ. So it's not just church, it's kingdom work. And we take it very seriously. And in your life, and in your life, that make it better list, like I said earlier, it's not enough to be aware of what you need to make better. You got to be growing. We are continuously making things better. We bring our best and we're always getting better. I'm grateful for a community of people here that is continuously excelling. Amen. Like, we're getting better at a lot of things. Praise God that the fact that we have four drummers here, and I'm no longer there, and they're great. They're better than me, so that I could be here. Right? That's good, and God is good in those moments. So we're always getting better. Statement three, we're always grateful, we never grumble. We're always grateful, we never grumble. Oh, boy. See, you can view life as a burden or life as a gift. You can view ministry or your job as an option or a burden, or you could view it as every opportunity that you have or every space that you step in as a ministry moment, as a chance to change someone's life. And then be grateful about it. Philippians 2, 14 through 15 says, Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God, without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like the stars in the sky. Come on. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says, always, say always. always. Be joyful. 
Never. Say never. Never. Never stop praying. Be thankful. Say thankful. thankful. Be thankful in all circumstances for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Again, Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Keep grumbling. Y'all, if, if you grumble in your marriage, watch your marriage crumble. If you grumble in your parenting style, I, it's probably going to feel like grumbling. If you keep grumbling at the job, well, let's see how that works out for you. If you grumble while you're serving here, I would say, how does that hurt a ministry that you're, you're serving in? See, if you show up with a grateful heart, if you show up with joy in every circumstance, you, and you can be joyful unto the Lord, because, you see, joy doesn't have to do with being happy about any of our circumstances. We, we spoke on this a couple months ago between joy and happiness, right? Happiness is fleeting, But joy is everlasting. Joy is from the spirit of God. And see, when I choose to have joy no matter what, when you are a joyful person to be around, when life is crumbling, or when you're hit hard with circumstances, you watch, you watch the attitude and the atmosphere of everything shifts. People don't know what to do with you. You're honoring God and you're inspiring other people to follow him. I think of a lady here in our church who just got diagnosed with cancer. She's got a beautiful family. Beautiful family. And man, her response has been so amazing, full of joy. And guess what it's done to others? Man, it's radiated throughout the the community. Man, they're like, I want that. I want that. And guess what? I I believe that this is a temporary assignment. Like she's going to be healed in Jesus' name. But guess what? God is using this to inspire others around her because she's chosen to be grateful and not grumble in this situation. Amen? In Jesus' name. Come on. I'm wrapping up here, y'all. I feel like I'm just getting started. You guys got three hours? Okay. (laughs) Last statement. We always go the extra mile. Say that with me. We always go the extra mile. Hmm. See, there's a story in Genesis 24. It's an Abraham story, so bear with me for a second. Let Let me tie this in, okay? So Abraham... He's looking for a wife for his son, Isaac. And he's like, hey, I don't want my, his wife to come from the Canaanites where I'm currently living. So he calls his, his servant, Eleazar. He's like, hey, Eleazar, go back to my home country. Go find Isaac a wife. So Eleazar goes to his country and, and he makes this deal with God. And he says, God, this is how we're gonna find Isaac a wife. I'm gonna go to this well I'm going to sit there. I'm going to ask for water. And this woman, she will give me that water, but she will give water for my camels too. That's how I'll know God. That's how I'll know that I found the right person. I know it's a strange story. You're thinking, what does it have to do with excellence or going the extra mile? Well, Rebecca shows up at the well and Eleazar is there looking for the wife. Eleazar asks Rebecca and says, hey, give me some water. She says, sure, absolutely. And I'll give you water for your 10 camels. <laughs> I love this stuff, y'all. This happens in natural day too. And so God confirms to Eleazar, that's the one. But what's the point? See, it doesn't sound like much is required. You're just drawing water up out of the well for these camels and for this guy that you don't know. But there's a lot that Rebecca doesn't quite know. See, she doesn't know, one, that this is a test. She doesn't know that Eliezer already made a deal with God. Secondly, what she doesn't know is how thirsty are those camels? How thirsty are those camels? Like, it's enough. Like, if I go to the well, if she goes to the well, and she draws up this bucket for Eliezer to drink, it's, it's a big old bucket, right? We're just assuming that. He can't drink the whole thing, so Eliezer is good. She's good. It's a one-time thing. They go about their way. But no, she says, I'll, 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 I'll water your camels too. <laughs> but guess what? Look this up. You can Google this. If you look this up, a camel can drink as much as 20 to 30 gallons by himself. <laughs> 
So she has no idea if she just made a, a two to three gallon commitment or a 300 gallon commitment. Oh, you're like, oh, I'm seeing where this is going. She, she has no idea. She doesn't know if they've traveled a long ways and if those camels are bone dry. She doesn't know if they just drank, but she says, I'm committing to that. I'm willing to go that extra mile. And here's the interesting thing about that story. She ends up marrying the second wealthiest man in the Middle East, Isaac. She becomes a mother of a nation. Ooh. From her lineage comes King David, which we all know who comes from King David, the lineage, the Jesus. She had no idea, y'all. I mean, she just showed up. She looked at a job and it seemed mundane. She looked at a, a process and it just seemed mundane. And she found herself in saying, well, I'm going to do my best. I'm just going to go all the way. I don't see any real connection to a calling here. I don't see a real connection to anything past just giving someone water, but I'm going to do it to the best of my ability, even if it's a 300-gallon commitment. So she went the extra mile. And how many of you would be a tad grateful in your life if, if you knew that the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Messiah was coming through your family? Think of the cities that we're trying to transform. What if that came through you and what you do? It's no wonder we got to do things well. It's no wonder we got to be better than yesterday at what we do. We don't just wake up and do the same things over and over and call that perfection. No, we, we got to be better. See, Jesus might just come through your family. He might just be coming through your line of work, your situation, your scenarios that you find yourself. Like how amazing would it be that if you were praying for somebody, if you were praying for somebody for 30 years and then your, your, your brother or sister on the other side were good at what they do in that job setting, it happened to be the person that activates the Jesus in their life because they did things well. Rebecca had no idea, so she went the extra mile. Hey, listen, stay with me, I'm, I'm closing up here. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing in excellence. Hold nothing back. In our life, we should never, 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 never settle for mediocrity. We should never settle for being above average. Life is too short for you to go through the motions, y'all. Like it's too short for you to give half of your effort to your family. Life is too short for you to just halfway invest in your marriage, your children, or half of your time into your business. Or it's, it's too short for you not to take your spiritual well-being and development more seriously. It's too short not to pour out everything and anything for God. So that's why we're saying we do things with excellence. We're going to be people who bring our best. We're going to continually get better at what we do. We're gonna be joyful and grateful in our circumstances, not grumble. And we're gonna be people who are willing to go the extra mile. Would you stand with me? See, Jesus went the extra mile. Jesus went the extra mile. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, that." that he would lay down his life for a friend. And if you know Jesus, if you know anything about Jesus, he would never tell us or do anything that he himself would not be willing to do. So when it came down to laying down his life for us, he said, is it worth it? Absolutely. You were worth laying down his life. He was willing to go the extra mile for you. He said, absolutely, I'm gonna do that. See, he gives us this life full of forgiveness. He didn't expect you to be perfect. If you walk through the door expecting perfection, you could leave it at the door, you could leave it at this altar because God is the only perfect being. And he said, hey, I just came to give you a life of forgiveness, a life in me where I already paid the price. I willingly went the extra mile. All I'm asking from you is total surrender. Like, I don't care what you did yesterday. I don't care what you did before you came to church. I don't care what you're thinking of right now. I, I, I paid it all. And the only reason he was able to, be, to forgive us, to save us, is because he was willing to go the extra mile. And would you close your eyes with me? 
And see, in this moment, what you're feeling, you're in the presence of the almighty God. You're feeling and sensing this place because God is here. And this is a real life moment. Like it's not an accident that you're here. It's not an accident that you're listening online. I don't believe in coincidences. These are divine appointments for you. So what I would say to you, hey, if any part of this message, if you say, God, I can make things better. I, I gotta get to work on my spiritual life. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Amen, Jesus, thank you. Maybe you're like, God, I, I wanna bring my very best. I've been striving for perfection and it's getting me frustrated. God's saying, I didn't ask for perfection, I asked for your best. Would you just give it to me? If that's you, would you raise your hand? You've been striving for perfection, okay. If you came in here and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, if you want to rededicate your life, look, you didn't just walk in here on accident. God created in you dreams. He created in you visions. He gave you a specific talent. He wants to use that for his glory. He wants you to be able to transform cities. He wants you to be able to create, to culture, to motivate, to, to nurture good things for him. If you would just be willing to say yes to him fully. If that's you, I want to pray for you. Would you raise your hand? Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Father, Lord, all of these hands that were raised, God, it is not enough to be aware of our issues. It is not enough to aware, be aware and never make things better. So, Father, we are saying to you, we are commit, committing ourselves to you to be better. Not perfect, for you are only perfect, Father. We are committing to ourselves to a life of excellence. Our service is full of excellence to you. Our, our work, we're saying we want to be excellent for you in our marriages, in our finances, in our, our relationships, God. And so, Father, in this moment, Lord, would you just break the walls of perfection, people thinking that they need to be perfect, God, would you just break that in the name of Jesus? I pray that they would be willing to take the next step. Whatever the next step it is you are calling them to do, that they would take the next step. Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, may this word go within us and activate us to be better. For God, we are not just a church. We are your ambassadors here on earth, God, to influence this world for your kingdom, God. It is the most important mission you've given us. So for everyone here, I say, God, would you fall fresh upon them? Give them a fresh feeling of your Holy Spirit. And for those who, who are, are weak, Lord, would you strengthen them in the name of Jesus? Would you give them the hope that they are searching for? And would you surround them with the community that does life around the presence of God? So, Lord, we thank you for this moment in time, God, and we praise you, and we give you all our best, God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen, amen. Hey, so if you raise your hand, if you need prayer, our prayer partners are up here, they would love to pray with you. Make that step. Make that step. Do something different. Remember, it's not enough to be aware of what the issues are. We want to prepare you to do the next things, and so... Y'all, practice excellence. I pray that you would just grab this to heart and practice excellence in everything that you do. We love you. We thank you. We'll see you next week.